The President, please be seated. The court is now back in session. Before the chamber hands over the floor to the co-prosecutors, the chamber wishes to inform the prosecutors that uh, you will have the two hours uh, to put questions uh, to the witness as um, requested. Uh, you have already used uh, 90 minutes uh, of this, so you have 30 minutes left, and the civil party lawyers will have one hour for the witness examination. Merci I am most grateful, Mr. President, for your chamber's ruling. Just before the break, Mr. Witness, we were talking about slogans and mottos you would have heard being broadcast over the radio being announced by the Khmer Rouge. To be specific, I wish to cite a passage from your book. It is on page 65 of the French version, page 51 of the English, and in Khmer ERN 00, 862351. You write the following. This cleansing, this evacuation, corresponds to a vision of man, man who is sullied or corrupted by corrupt society cannot be changed. He must be placed in a pure community. You quote a certain number of slogans. The regime must be destroyed. The enemy must be utterly crushed. What is infected must be cut out. What is rotten must be removed. What is too long must be shortened and made the right length. It isn't enough to cut down a bad plant. It must be uprooted. Those are among the slogans used both on the radio and at meetings to justify the purge. Mr. Witness, can you please tell this court what the Khmer Rouge meant by the notion of purity and the community or the brotherhood of the pure based on what you heard, based on what you were told by the refugees and based on what you heard on the radio? Response. This question is difficult to respond. I already handed over to Mr. Max Lamont a document in which I explained to him. That part I was explaining about the t status in Khmer society. The real villagers or people were the peasants. And the lower middle class poor peasants. The pure Khmer people are those who do not take a private ownership as important. And the Anka took that as uh, an honor or prestige uh, that uh, they, they offered or, or they dubbed uh, the pure people. Un instrument docile dans les mains de A docile instrument in the hands of Ankar. 
Krishna. So the pure people did not possess their own thoughts. They had to devote to follow the Anka policy and plan. They care only for the interests of the nation. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, witness. Now I would like to turn to another topic, uh, which in your book you spoke about the fact uh, that uh, when you were at the French Embassy, you had been able to listen to the funk radio, and that on the funk radio there was a long speech by Que Saint Pont that was repeated many, many times and that was stating the general objectives of the revolution. So, do you remember the content of the speech? I believe it was broadcast on the 22nd of April, 1975. Response. I don't remember this clearly because at that time I did not pay great attention to Khmer Rouge ideology we were rather caught up in uh, our brain uh, were confused. Thank you. Uh, to, in order to refresh your memory, witness, I would like to refer to document E3-118. Uh, I'm sorry, this, in fact, it was a speech from the 21st of April, not the 22nd of, of April. So it was a victory speech on Radio Phnom Penh, and with the leave of the chamber, may I uh, provide the witness with a copy of this document and display this speech on uh, the screen as well. The President, you may proceed. The court officer is now directed to bring the documents to the witness for examination. Merci. Thank you. So the ERN in English, ERN 00166994. I repeat, 00166994. French, 00848594. Five eight five four to five five zero zero five eight five four five five and Khmer zero zero eight four six one six zero 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 eight four six one six zero. I'm going to read one single excerpt which is at the beginning of the speech. This is what Kyosampan says. Free translation. After the most valiant fight that occurred, after having endured all kinds of suffering and hardship, and with great heroism, and after having endured great sacrifice during five years and one month, our most valiant FP, FAPLNK fighters and our people have been able to defeat the most merciless war of, of aggression carried out by the American imperialists and have completely crushed the most disloyal, the most fascist, and the most corrupt regime that exists. That is to say the regime of the traitors Londol, Sirik Matak, Sondoknan, Chingheng, Intam, Longboret, and Sosten Fernandez. And a bit further, this, this great victory opened the most brilliant and righteous way that there is, this way that brought the Cambodian people and the FAPLNK to carry out a powerful people's war to combat the enemies on all fronts, whether it be military, political, and or economical. And this has led us to, 
support our efforts to evacuate the inhabitants from the zones controlled by the enemies by outdoing the enemy's tricks, by attacking the enemy with relentlessly, by undermining its military, economic and financial strength, and by depriving the enemy of its supplies and of its rice. The enemy finally died in great suffering. End of quote, free translation. So this, here are the first excerpts of this speech. Does this remind you of the content that was broadcast on the funk radio back then? Response. They say that uh, they won the victory through conventional weapons. That's all I still remember. No, traditional. Traditional. Traditional was the word. Merci. You in the same speech, a bit further. On, que son pan speaks about um, constantly reinforcing a revolutionary vigilance. Did you know what this term revolutionary vigilance meant? And did the refugee accounts shed any light on this? Response. At that time, we did not pay attention to the propaganda made by the Khmer Rouge. We shared the suffering of Cambodian people, in particular Phnom Penh dwellers who had been evacuated. I may also, Khmer Rouge uh, used the language that was different uh, from what they used uh, before, so we had to understand their way of speaking. They talked about masters of independence, they talked about private, uh, no private ownership, and they talked uh, about the stance, the organizational stance, and these are the terms we never used before. We were reminded that uh, by that uh, they meant uh, people who talked differently from the way they thought would be, um, you know, eliminated. Merci, Jean. Thank you. Okay, I won't go any further with this question, but I have two questions left, or two mini-topics, rather. And what impacted me in your book is uh, the usage of the word prisoner of war by yourself and by the refugees regarding prisoners of war who were slaves, regarding the people who had been evacuated. So could you tell us in which context the Khmer Rouge used these terms, this term prisoner of war? Response. Ankar used the term the 17th of April people, people who were liberated on the 17th of April, or they refer to them as the new people. Other people who 
had uh, been living in the countryside all along had been regarded as the old people or the base people. And sometimes they even talked about the people who were the prisoners of war. I heard uh, this uh, from radio broadcasts. But normally, they only used uh, the terms uh, the 17th of April people or the new people. They did not uh, use the term slave and uh, they refer them as uh, refugees and this term was, was not uh, used by Anka. And later on, at, uh, in about 1976 or 1977, they even used uh, a new term, we call it the candidate uh, people. Ben Kinnan misinterpreted uh, the term. They, uh, ben Kinnan said that these candidate people were the people who were sent uh, uh, to the country. And I, rather, I uh, uh, refer to uh, these uh, uh, candidate uh, people as, uh, or depositary people, as those who were sent to be controlled by the old people. Entrusted. Merci. Thank you. Uh, in the accounts that you gathered from the refugees, did the refugees tell you whether or not they enjoyed certain individual liberties under the Khmer Rouge, or if indeed they were treated as prisoners of war? Response. The new people, or the 17th of April, people did not enjoy any freedom at all. Later on, from 1977, both the base or the old people and the new people did not enjoy any freedom. From 1977, the new situation uh, occurred uh, when there was a conflict uh, between Cambodia and Vietnam. Two dernière question, Monsieur. My very last question, witness. Uh, I quoted earlier an excerpt uh, from an interview of Yang Sari by James Pringle, where he said in September 1975 uh, that Cambodia was a giant workshop. And in view of the suppression of all individual uh, freedoms for the 17 April people, and later on for the base people, did you hear from the refugees whose accounts you gathered, did you hear words such as open air prison instead of workshop, for example? Response. Normally, the refugees would talk about the prison without walls. But uh, in the Khmer Rouge uh, radio broadcast, they referred uh, to these uh, places as the work sites, the place uh, where people had to work days and nights. They worked uh, 
uh, without thinking of uh, being tired or the suffering they had uh, endured. Thank you very much, witness. Now I will give the floor to my colleague who has a few questions uh, during, uh, to, for the remaining time that is allotted to us. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. President, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning to Mr. Francois Poncho. I am Chandara Ratsamai, National Co-Prosecutor from the Co-Prosecutor's Office. Due to time constraints, uh, I would like to only uh, be brief and have very few questions uh, for you. Can you please uh, help clarify a point that uh, you said uh, at the French Embassy there were the seven super traitors and other individuals uh, who were the spouses uh, who married to foreigners and were forced uh, to leave the embassy. Were these people asked to leave peacefully or at gunpoint? And if so, who did that uh, to expel them from the embassy? Response. So far as I remember, no people were forced uh, at gunpoint uh, to leave uh, the embassy. I remember there was a senior cadre who asked people who had. Uh, French family or spouses to leave. They did not threaten those people. They only asked them to leave. And the people were afraid. We were afraid of uh, the Khmer Rouge in general, anyway. And whatever they told us to do, we had to follow them. Question. You said uh, you were present uh, at that time. Can you also tell the chamber, please, what was uh, the reaction by the French embassy regarding such order to leave? Response. During the Khmer Rouge, uh, the environment made uh, everyone feel terrified, even Mr. Jean Jirac, uh, who was the consular official, was uh, terrified himself. He did not uh, protest uh, uh, such order or instruction, and we had just uh, follow suit. Question. Regarding the evacuation of the population of Phnom Penh, you already testified um, a lot on this, but we would like you to also add a few more points, uh, whether you had ever met any senior leaders of the Khmer Rouge before you left uh, Cambodia. If so, did you ever hear or have you ever been told by any of the senior leaders uh, about the plan to evacuate uh, the city? Response. I only knew Comrade Nyem, who contacted us, and the, uh, he was a focal person between Anka and us. And I only heard from him uh, that uh, we had to uh, leave. I never met any other cadres of Anka. Question. Have you ever met or did you ever meet uh, Mr. Kilsen Pond after 1975 either in person or through other uh, arrangements if uh, 
you did, uh, please tell the chamber. If not, it is fine. The President, uh, Mr. Witness, could you please hold on? Counsel for Mr. Kilsompon, you are on your feet. You may now proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Say, Counsel Kung Som On. The witness already talked about this. He said he met uh, him once uh, eight years ago. Co prosecutor, thank you, Counsel, uh, for this. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, I would like to uh, move to the next question instead. Uh, Mr. Pong Shou, when you were in Cambodia, and the, at the time when you left uh, Phnom Penh in 1975, what was your impression concerning what you saw that made you remember when you were traveling from Phnom Penh all the way to the border area? Response, what uh, made me excited uh, was that uh, the road uh, was completely empty from the French Embassy to Udong to Kampung Chenang, Posat and Barambong. We did not see a soul and that already terrified us because uh, I believe that at that time we were leaving the ghost di country. We did not meet a Cambodian, not even a single soul. And we saw the smoke coming out of uh, some fields uh, and the villages. Uh, we presumed that it could be the smoke from burning uh, houses or from the fields that were uh, burned. Question. Did you also witness any protests by the villagers who did not wish to leave Phnom Penh during the evacuation? And if they did, uh, what would uh, be the result of such resistance. Response. Yesterday I already mentioned about the incidences that happened in two locations when the, the fighting happened between Lonol soldiers and the Khmer Rouge. And uh, apart from this, uh, I did not see anyone fighting back because uh, my observation was that people were leaving the city and no one would be coming from the wrong direction. Every now and then I heard gunshots, but I did not know whether the Khmer were firing these gunshots and perhaps uh, it could have been the sound of the doors uh, being banged uh, shut by the soldiers during this ordeal. Question, during the evacuation phase, were people separated from their family members? Response, I knew from the refugees, although I did not see this myself, normally, Anka allow family members to be together. Now, for example, at Prek Dam, people had to march uh, through National Road Number 5, and they were carried uh, by the ferry. And when the ferry was full, uh, for example, if the family members uh, would already be uh, on board the ferry and uh, the remaining family members would be on uh, the other side of the river, then the Khmer would never care to uh, bring them uh, together. They just would like the ferry to uh, cross uh, the river. Question. In the aftermath of the evacuation policy being implemented, 
Is that your knowledge uh, that uh, people would be treated differently? For example, like the Cham, the Vietnamese, or the Chinese uh, who had been living in the country during that time? Response. All population of the city was uh, entirely evacuated. They were not uh, evacuated discriminately. So except uh, those uh, foreigners who were French uh, nationals or who got married uh, to the French uh, citizens who had to take refuge at the French embassy. And I also wish to also add that uh, in late 1975, uh, Ankara allowed uh, Vietnamese immigrants to return to their home country. We believe uh, in general that uh, the Khmer Rouge could have killed uh, the Vietnamese uh, people, but that is not true because the Khmer Rouge uh, did uh, help uh, these uh, Vietnamese to uh, be repatriated. And I also have ample documents to support this assertion. And uh, again, by late 1975, these uh, uh, Khmer Rouge or Onka helped uh, Vietnam to return home. co prosecutor thank you, Mr. Witness, and thank you, Mr. President, Your Honors. Uh, I have no further questions to put uh, uh, to the witness, and with that, I wish uh, the witness all the best. The President, uh, thank you. Next, uh, we would like to hand over to the lead co-lawyers for the civil parties to put questions to the witness. Counsel Pick Ang. Good morning, Mr. President, uh, and good morning, Your Honors. Councils uh, who will be putting questions to uh, the witness uh, will be Council Elizabeth and uh, uh, Moj Savanari. Council Moj Savanari. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honors, and very good morning to you. Mr. Witness, I am Moj Sovanari here, represent civil parties who are victims of the Khmer Rouge. I have a few questions for you. These questions are classified into two sections. First, I would like to ask a few questions, uh, the follow-up questions, questions that have already been uh, put uh, to the witness. And secondly, I would like uh, to ask uh, the witness about the information he has obtained from the refugees, in particular the accounts of the refugees who shared concerning their suffering under the Khmer Rouge regime and during the time when they became the refugees. The first question that I wish to ask you now is a follow-up question. Yesterday, you responded to the president of the trial chamber that on the evening of the 17th of April, 1975, a group of soldiers would like to take refuge at your home, and you talked with them the whole night, and you were deprived of your sleep. When you talked to the soldiers the whole night without sleep, uh, what did you talk to them? Did you talk about Khmer Rouge ideology? Did you talk about the plan to evacuate the city? Or you talk anything about uh, what could happen to the country at that time? Response. These soldiers came from Srasrong uh, from Siem Reap. I do not wish to talk about ideology or the Ankar's plan because these people perhaps did not know about it, or I myself was not brave enough to engage in this perhaps politically motivated uh, topic because uh, these soldiers already showed their, uh, the facial impression that 
uh, is not uh, ver that was not very friendly, and that's uh, enough for me not to engage uh, or invoke uh, such discussion. The president, uh, council, could you slow down a little bit uh, when you are putting question uh, to the witness uh, for good record, indeed. Council. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, for reminding. I have another question. Yesterday, you said on one occasion, you brought uh, some Khmer Rouge soldiers to the railway station for a meeting. And at that time, you said that uh, there was a meeting. Can you tell the chamber how many people attended uh, the meeting and what was the subject matter of such meeting? A response yesterday, I said about uh, the railway station, but I did not mention about the meeting being convened uh, at the train station. I talked about the people who asked me to bring them to the railway station. I did not know whether they would have a meeting there, or perhaps they would uh, uh, be there to uh, discuss about the plan to fight uh, at the border. And I said, uh, uh, to the, to the Khmer Rouge deceitfully uh, that there were six soldiers who would be meeting at the train station. And I learned at a later date uh, that there were different groups of soldiers, young soldiers, old soldiers, those who wore black clothes or dark green clothes. And I felt uh, suspicious because uh, I knew that there could have been other group of soldiers mingled together in this city. And then I uh, noted that there were six soldiers who met. I did not know what they were doing. Thank you, Mr. Witness. Yesterday, you also answered the question by Judge uh, Lavergne, and in that testimony, uh, you made mention the uh, uh, carter of the Khmer Rouge by the name of uh, Nyem, and he, you also said that he was not uh, holding position of importance, and he was not in the position to uh, enter into any political negotiation. What was the uh, basis uh, you rely on in order to come to the conclusion that uh, he was not a senior uh, Khmer Rouge uh, candidate? Uh, what do you base your, your answer on? I do not know how to explain, uh, and I can hardly distinguish between the uh, high ranking and so a uh, lower uh, ranking uh, official. Both uh, Biso and I, uh, we uh, communicated with uh, Comrade Niem uh, on a daily basis. Uh, we only asked him for the daily day-to-day -day work uh, for our survival in French embassy. We did not talk politics uh, at that times with him, and later on, uh, there was another cadre, and I suspected that he was somebody of higher ranking uh, position. I did not know his name. Uh, he was a cadre and supposedly a higher ranking uh, official, uh, according to uh, the words uh, he used. He said he conveyed the words and uh, instruction from the upper authority. He told everyone that. Uh, um, His Excellency Kiel Sampon wanted uh, to talk to people at the French Embassy, but he was being engaged uh, in reorganizing the revolutionary forces. Uh, so he was addressing uh, us at that time in the position uh, of uh, somebody important. So I thought uh, that he was uh, somebody in a ranking, uh, higher ranking official. For example, there was uh, another character. Uh, negotiating uh, with us about the repatriation uh, of the uh, f uh, foreign national in the French embassy. So I uh, could uh, assume uh, that those uh, people were from higher ranking positions.
Question. Thank you. On this uh, particular issue, you mentioned Mr. Q. Sampon yesterday, and today you say there was a cadre, and uh, supposedly he was a uh, holding position of importance. Uh, he met with him, uh, and he talked to you about uh, Mr. Q. Sampon. And in your book, uh, relevant page in Khmer, 0086 to 302, English 0086. Two zero three four, French zero zero, eight six two one, four seven. This is a excerpt uh, in your book describing the events relevant to Mr. Kiu Sampon. On, I am not going to uh, read out this excerpt uh, from your book, but I just would like to ask you to expand on this. At that time, I, I just would like you to tell the court uh, whether or not that card uh, told uh, you uh, what position Mr. Kiu Sampon held, and whether or not uh, that person uh, mentioned uh, Mr. Kiu Sampon. And in your book, you address him with a. Uh, Higher-ranking title uh, as Excellency. So, uh, did uh, the person uh, told tell you at that time uh, what position Mr. Kiu Sampon held? Response: At that time, uh, that comrade uh, told us uh, that Mr. Kiu Sampon was somebody uh, among the leaders who led the country at that time. But uh, there was no uh, mention of a specific position. But uh, they only say that Mr. Kiu Sampon was among the leaders of the country. Uh, he did not make mention of Pol Pot or any other official. And in my book, I mention uh, the men by the names of Pot, Ham, Van, and these uh, were the names uh, of the high-ranking official in the upper authority. And Pek Lim Kuen, who was the uh, helicopter uh, pilot, uh, he also shared with me the names. But I did not. In my book, I describe Comrade Port. I did not know who Comrade Port was. Probably Nong Suan or Salat So. Comrade Ham, I did not know either. But Comrade Ham is now with us now. At that time, I did not know. And Von Wade. Uh, uh, Comrade Warren uh, was Warren Wade. I did not know who was actually at the apparatus uh, of the Khmer Rouge uh, or Anka at that time. But uh, we knew that later that uh, Comrade Paul was a lot so. I learned uh, about it in uh, September 1977. And, and so lot so once went to China to announced the existence of the Communist Party of Cambodia. Question. Thank you. Just now you uh, told the national prosecutor that uh, you did not meet uh, Mr. Kiu Sampon later on. So my follow-up question uh, to this, uh, have you uh, Heard, or did you ever hear when you were residing in France that Mr. Kilsampon had traveled to France in order to appeal to the Cambodian intellectuals who were pursuing their study in France to return to Cambodia to help rebuild the country? Or did you ever hear uh, any statement made by Mr. Kilsampon uh, to uh, this effect? Response. I guess uh, you might have uh, misunderstood me. Actually, uh, Mr. Kilsampon did not go to France. It was Mr. Ying Sari. Mr. Ying Sari went to France and he convened a meeting uh, in a, a place. Uh, it was a very big uh, place. And Mr. before Mr. Ying Sari went to France, uh, he uh, prepared a big a, a, a video footage uh, of uh, the appeal and as well as the situations in Cambodia. And then he went there. He appealed to the Cambodian intellectual residing in France to return to the Cambodia to help rebuild the country. And I think uh, our court 
also invited uh, Mr. Ong Tung Hoon to testify as well. At that time, Mr. Ong Tung Hoon was, uh, was with me. He uh, listened to the address by Mr. Ian Sari. And then I told him that you must not return to Cambodia. But at that time, he did not believe me. He blamed me. He said he accused me of being CIA. I, but I told, I, told, I told him that he must not return to Cambodia. Uh, lawyer, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Witness, I would like to interrupt you. You have already answered my question. I would like to now continue with another question. This morning you said Anka was very good at lying, lying the people or tricking the people. So I would like to ask you to expand on this. When did Anka uh, start to lie people and how did you come to know this? Anka pra piet. Anka used lie uh, to actually lure people to uh, follow them, and it was a tactic they used at that time to control the situation. Uh, they uh, deploy this uh, trick in order to evacuate people out of the city. And I noticed, I, I came to notice this uh, because uh, in the propaganda, they use uh, certain words now, for example, great leap forward, the glorious 17th April, so on and so forth. These were some things that I uh, came to know that that were some things that the Anka is actually lying the people, especially when they uh, executed the innocent people, as I mentioned this morning. One man in Kinswai, uh, he, uh, he appealed uh, to the soldiers and senior ranking officers of the previous regime to write down their names on a board, and eventually these people were executed. So this, this, this happened on the 20th of April, 1975. Thank you, witness. I would like to move to my second part concerning uh, the information you obtained from the victims regarding the suffering they have endured. With leave uh, from Mr. President, I would like to present a document uh, written by the, uh, by the witness. Uh, document D133-1.2. The President, uh, you may proceed. A court officer is now instructed to obtain the hard copy document from the lawyer and present it to the witness for his examination. The President, please make sure that your mic is uh, activated. Mr. President, I would also like uh, to have it uh, displayed on the screen in Khmer 0083. 2483 English 00609102 French 00410324 In the document that you have uh, before you I have highlighted for you uh, in uh, with green coat uh, in this part you mention based on this uh, Cam the whole Cambodia uh, was turned into an open uh, work site, and people did not consider whether or not they were working during the day or night. They were working tirelessly with, uh, with joy. So I would like to ask you, uh, what basis or, or how did you base your, your uh, writing on? Did you receive any information from any sources, and how do you confirm that these uh, sources is reliable? Response. So at that time, we, uh, we, I, I based on the uh, radio broadcast uh, by the uh, Democratic Cambodia radio. Uh, when we have the uh, Quotation, then uh, we quoted from the radio broadcast. Question. 
Uh, can you expand uh, the uh, substance of this uh, quotation based on the radio broadcast as well as the uh, subsequent information you received from the victims uh, who uh, came across this regime? Uh, were they really uh, enjoying uh, the work that they were doing at that time uh, in that so-called vast work site? Response. I explained yesterday when I started conducting research uh, on uh, the uh, in Cambodia starting from uh, September 1975. First, I listened to the refugees. Refugees uh, tell the accounts of their uh, past experience that uh, I could hardly believe it. Uh, they say they worked uh, day and night. Uh, but bef bef earlier on, I uh, could hardly believe them because it was beyond anyone's imagination. But later on, uh, I had an idea uh, to go and listen to the radio broadcast by the Democratic Cambodia because at that time I saw that uh, Anka was not crazy enough uh, to make people do uh, such a harsh job because uh, the Anka's leaders were uh, well educated, like Solot Saw was uh, educated in France. Uh, so I thought that they must have had a very well organized plan to develop the country. I thought in the first place that uh, they had good intention for the development of the country. So I, at that time, paid more attention to listening to the Khmer Rouge uh, radio broadcast in order to um, uh, follow uh, the uh, 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 political lines. And you see uh, here, uh, when I quoted uh, using the uh, inverted commas over here, uh, actually it was the direct quote from the radio broadcast. And in other part, I actually based on uh, the broadcast of the Democratic Cambodia radio. And if you read uh, over there outside the quotation, uh, it was the uh, report based on the accounts of people who have uh, come across uh, this period. Uh, they worked very hard. Uh, actually, uh, they did not work with joy and pride, but actually they worked uh, very hard, extremely hard. Now, for example, uh, interrupt counsel. Uh, I think you have already answered my question. I have, due to uh, my uh, time uh, limitation, I need to pursue uh, my next uh, line of questioning. So my next question, uh, with permission from Mr. President, I would like to present another document, uh, D134.1, entitled In Khmer, uh, Cambodia Liberation Year. The President, uh, you may proceed. In this uh, particular document, I would like to refer to only a relevant portion of the book, uh, relevant year and in Khmer, 00, 32, 37, 35, English, 00, 32, 3693, French, 00, 28, 3064. On this particular portion of your book, you say uh, from the 17th of April 1975, some 20,000 Cambodians uh, decided to um, leave the country. They crossed border sometimes on the 17th of April. And in December every year, two or three uh, people arrived at Arang Pratet. So based on your interview with those refugees, uh, did they tell you the reason why they decided to take a risk to exile to other country? 
uh, because uh, at that time they must have known uh, that uh, their country was uh, liberated, but on the contrary, they decided to take all the risk to cross the border illegally uh, to a foreign country. There were different uh, categories of people. Now, the civil servants or soldiers of the previous regimes, they ran into uh, the border because they want to uh, escape uh, from that. For example, one man uh, by the name of Samien, he was uh, considered the most corrupt official. He sells uh, rice uh, to the uh, Khmer Rouge. Uh, so at that time when the Khmer Rouge concurred in the war, uh, they uh, fled uh, in fear of um, reprisal of the uh, Khmer Rouge at that time. And some people who live uh, some 30 kilometers away from the uh, from the border, uh, they told uh, us, uh, uh, they heard from others that the Khmer Rouge uh, killed so many people, so they decided to, uh, to flee uh, the country. Uh, at that time, uh, we, we learned uh, that many people were terrified for that, and they fled for their life. Yeah, so Thank you, Mr. Witness. I have uh, my last two questions uh, concerning the same uh, topic. Uh, my first question, I refer to the same document that I uh, uh, handed over to you, document D133-1.2. And I would like uh, to extract uh, the relevant page, EAN 00 in Khmer, 0024-85, English 00-609103, French 00-410324. On this particular portion, you mention uh, the refugees whom you interview concerning the uh, second phase of population movement. According to you, you said, uh, according to the refugees who arrived in Thailand, uh, they said uh, that uh, the uh, second wave of uh, population movement led to many more casualty. Uh, the numbers of casualty were even more than uh, the first wave of evacuation in 1975. That was due to the uh, uh, food uh, shortages as well as uh, diseases and other living conditions. So when you met with those refugees, uh, could you tell the court uh, what suffering did they uh, tell you when they were uh, being evacuated when, for example, they did not have sufficient food to eat, uh, they uh, did not have uh, access to medicine or health care, when they were forcibly evacuated from one place to another. What were the sufferings they uh, described to you at that time when you were interviewing them? On May or or June 1975 or early 1976, Anka evacuated uh, the population uh, for the second time. Uh, I uh, wrote this uh, this uh, article again because Judge Lomong uh, might have confused uh, through the uh, interpretation. Uh, there were people who were transported from Takao uh, to Phnom Penh and then they were uh, taken by, carried by the train, and then uh, they went all the way uh, to Phnom Thapade near Mukolbore. It was like Hitler uh, taking Yuda. The Khmer Rouge uh, were not Hitler, they were communists, they were, they were not Nazi. Nazi. They uh, describe uh, their accounts of the events at that time. So it was uh, a barbaric uh, treatment. Uh, they were staying in the wagon of the train. They were not given food. They were not given water. Uh, they did not have place uh, to uh, advocate or to 
release uh, themselves, uh, they had to stay uh, in the small wagon packed with people over there. It was like the U.S. were being taken uh, by the Nazis uh, uh, in the past. So among those people, there were so many casualties. And if you want to see clarification on this uh, situation, you can ask uh, Kum Nal. Uh, he was a former uh, doctor at uh, Keto Mili Hospital, and he was the person who received those people in Sisupon, and he was one of the surviving witnesses. Thank you, uh, witness. You have answered my question, and actually you also answered my last question that I'm about to ask, so I do not have any further question to you. And I thank you, Mr. President, uh, for giving me the opportunity to put the question uh, to the witness, and I thank you, witness, for endeavoring to answering my question. I would like to now cede the floor to my colleague, the President. Yes, uh, please, uh, lawyer, you may proceed. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning to all. Good morning to you, Mr. Witness. I would point out that I have approximately 30 minutes worth of questions. Mr. President, do you wish that I begin immediately, or do you wish that I commence following the lunch break? I'm in your hands, Mr. President. You may proceed now, and uh, we will try our best uh, to make use of the court time to ensure efficiency and expeditiousness uh, of the trial. So you may proceed. Thank you very much. Mr. Witness, my name is Elizabeth Simonofer. I'm a civil party lawyer in this trial. What is of concern to me is, and I will state it to you most bluntly, it's not what you think, uh, since I have very little time. What is of interest to me is what you witnessed with your own eyes, what you heard from the refugees who provided you oral testimony. As I stated yesterday, and as you stated yesterday, with which I fully agree, this is of the utmost importance for Cambodians. And it is most important that we uh, place on the record what they experienced. Therefore, I would ask that you clarify a certain number of matters, specifically the manner in which you gathered some of these testimonies and accounts as well as how you were able to report uh, on these testimonies, which eventually led you to the publication of some reports and articles. I also want to draw your attention to a report that was cited by Judge Laverne yesterday. I'm referring to document E3 slash 1004, a report that was submitted to this Human Rights Subcommission in July 1978. I will also be referring to the two articles published in the French daily Le Monde that were also referred to yesterday by Judge Laverne and which bear the document numbers D133-1.2. With respect to the report that you submitted to this Human Rights Commission, you make mention of certain violations of human rights. You wrote that the violations were still ongoing. And you wrote your articles just a few months following the uh, rise to power of the Khmer Rouge in the first document, which is the report. You talk about several human rights violations, observations that you had made yourself based on the refugee accounts and which brought you to certain uh, 
equivocal opinions, including the movement of population. Yesterday, Judge Laverne wrote, uh, read to you a passage from the article, which I will not repeat here. In terms of the movement of uh, populations and uh, the first and second transfers, is it correct to say, sir, that your findings were the outcome of what you saw, heard, and learned when you were in Cambodia up until the start of May 1975. Until May 1975, I did not see anything. I saw the evacuation of people from Phnom Penh, but I could not see the fate of those people later on. What I knew was gained from my interview with the refugees from September 1975. In the interest of clarity, sir, you still noticed in Phnom Penh a certain number of things occurring between the 17th of April and your departure. I saw that Phnom Penh was empty. No people was over there. I saw the evacuation of 200 or 300 people along Manibung Boulevard. I did not see any other thing. People of all age, children, women, patients were all evacuated. I don't have do So they would die, they would surely die. Those women who have just given birth would have little chance to survive. Thank you for that clarification. Therefore, you have just stated that the findings were based on the refugee accounts. And as co-prosecutor recalled earlier this morning this was a systematic implementation of the policy. I want to turn to the second finding that you make in the report according to which you talk about human rights violations. You make a second series of observations regarding the lives of people and families in cooperatives and in work camps. In document E slash E three slash eighteen oh four you write husbands and wives are generally separated and they only reunite occasionally especially for the new people. Children are usually left to the older women of the cooperatives. And as of the age of six, they are practically uh, separated from their parents. They rarely have the chance to live together as a family. As of the age of 13 or 14, teenagers enter mobile troops, and they very rarely get to see their parents. In the Le Monde article, of the 17th of April, 1976, on ERN French 0041-0324, English 00609-102, Khmer 00832484. You write on the second series of observations that you had previously conveyed. This category of 
mobile workers are used by Encore. And this Anka seems to be bent on exploiting human potential to the very limit of its physical strength. Mr. Witness, if I understand correctly, these observations were based on what you heard from the refugees. Can you please confirm as to whether such comments were made by a great number of refugees who were either along the Thai border or along the Vietnamese border? I interviewed the refugee who fled into Thailand, not the refugee in Vietnam. And I also interviewed the refugee who went to France as well. The Khmer Rouge Radio also gave some information about the mobile unit, children unit. I learned about the Khmer Rouge society through the Khmer Rouge radio. I learned about the children unit, which was in charge of collecting cattle excrement and plants to be used as fertilizer. Later, there were mobile unit, women's unit. So this is the explanation from the Khmer Rouge radio. And they divided the people into two groups, those who were married. Husbands were assigned to work far away to clear forests, to plow rice fields, to fish. Women work close to the villages. The Khmer Radio explained that all age people Old people aged from 55 upward were assigned to make tool for farming. And they said that those people describe their work in happiness, they enjoy working. No, I didn't say that. Khmer Rouge uh, radio broadcast uh, broadcast about how the society should be educated and also how people lived their life. The President, uh, thank you, Mr. Witness and Council for the civil parties. It is now appropriate a moment for lunch adjournment. The Chamber will adjourn, and the next session so will be resumed by 1.30 p.m. Court officer is now instructed to assist the witness during this adjournment and have him return to the courtroom by 1.30 PM. Security personnel are now instructed to bring Mr. Kilson Pond to his holding cell and have him return to the courtroom when the next session resumes.